as you all know, Wake Forest Baptist has long been a leader in cancer research and cancer patient care. We're now in the next exciting generation of cancer discoveries, and Wake Forest will again be a leader in these areas. We're very fortunate to have an international cancer leader, Dr. Boris Pash, as the executive director of our Comprehensive Cancer Center. Wake Forest Baptist has one of the country's 41 NCI designated cancer centers, which is a mark of great distinction. What typifies NCI designated cancer centers is cutting edge research that is quickly brought to the bedside to improve the care of patients, to improve diagnosis, early detection of cancer, and equally important prevention. One of our most new exciting areas of work is in the area of precision medicine. Good to see you, Dr. Pash. Can you tell me what is precision medicine? Precision medicine is the next step in the treatment of cancer. It is based on the genetic makeup of the tumors uh, that a given patient harbors. And what we know is that these uh, genetic makeup changes a lot from one patient to the other. So the use of precision medicine uh, harvests, harnesses the progress that have been made with DNA technologies. And the tumor of a given patient will be sequenced very deeply, multiple time, to identify the drivers that push the growth of uh, that tumor in an attempt to find a drug that could block these drivers. So I guess historically, if you took a disease like, like breast cancer, for example, and you had two samples from two different patients underneath the microscope, they could look identical underneath the microscope and you would then assume that the therapies, identical therapies, would work equally well, well on those two, two women, but that's simply not the case. That is correct, and I think breast cancer is a very good example where in the past decade we have seen subsets of breast cancers that respond to very different therapies and they have also very different outcome based on the presence or absence of certain genetic makeup, which we are today using for more effective uh, and long-lasting therapies. So the therapy is very, very tailored then to the individual patient in that circumstance? In certain tumor type, it has become very tailored. In some others, it is less tailored. And this is where precision medicine comes into play. For patients who have tumors that have progressed, or for patients who have tumor that do not respond to chemotherapy, precision medicine is a very attractive option because with this approach, it will be possible to identify the Achilles heel of the tumor and potentially find a drug that will block the growth of this tumor, either a clinical trial or some known drugs that have not yet been testing, it, tested in that tumor type, but that target a specific uh, genomic abnormality in that tumor. So is there, are there specific types of patients who are more likely to benefit from this type of testing? Certainly patients who have failed first or second line therapies, patients with disease that we know have a poor outcome, uh, such as metastatic pancreatic cancer, metastatic lung cancer, uh, such tumors that tend not to respond to systemic therapies are prime example for uh, precision medicine. But in general, it's any type of tumor that has failed to respond first or second line therapy, or for patients with very rare tumors uh, that's for which we know very little about the best therapies. So this would not be the case that every single patient with an initial diagnosis of cancer would necessarily need genomic testing? Definitely not. And uh, for patients who have a disease that we know has a very high likelihood of cure, for example, an early stage breast cancer, early stage colon cancer, uh, this would not come into consideration because we know the chances of curing such patients are very high. Uh, on the other hand, if such a patient comes back two or three years later with a disease that has metastasized and that becomes refractory to our standard uh, treatment guidelines, these patients become eligible for precision medicine. I think there may be, uh, at least in some people's mind, a little confusion between the concept of genetic susceptibility to cancer and the genomics of a tumor itself, because there are certain cancers where there's inherited genetic abnormalities that can put you at increased risk of cancer, but that's not really what we're talking about here. Is that correct? They are sometime linked. And for example, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which are the most common 
uh, predisposing factor for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Most patients who harbor these genes and develop tumors have tumors with certain features, uh, which are frequently named triple negative uh, breast cancer tumors. And these tumors do not respond to standard therapies and thereby are prime candidate for precision medicine. I see. Um, I see. In some other instances, the predisposing gene do not reflect themselves in the tumor genetic makeup. So these are indeed two separate uh, areas. So from a patient's point of view, how does this actually work logistically? When is this testing done? You know, what, what is the test actually performed on? Getting results back and that sort of thing. So for a patient to be considered for uh, precision medicine, first of, first of all, the patient needs to be in good overall condition. One of the prime criteria is the performance status, which is defined by the uh, time spent out of bed uh, daytime spent out of bed needs to be more than 50%. So for example, a bedridden patient, an institutionalized patient that cannot move along would not be a good candidate for precision medicine. But any patient who has a good performance status and who has a disease that does not have a curable uh, option or for which the treatment guideline do not work anymore is a perfect candidate for precision medicine. What will happen then is that the patient's physician will request uh, that the tumor that either has been recently uh, harvested or that will need to be rebiopsied will be tested uh, by uh, genomic technology. So in other words, if the tumors were sampled just a few months before the tumor becomes refractory to uh, standard treatment, that biopsy will suffice. And in that case, that biopsy will be used for uh, genetic testing and based on this, we will tailor a therapy. So what will happen next is that it will take about one month from the time the tumor has been obtained until we obtain all the results from the sequencing. In some instances, it might be quicker, but one month is a reasonable uh, time frame. At that time, the physician will receive information about the genetic makeup of this tumor. And we know, for example, that for lung cancer, more than 60% of lung cancer will have a target uh, that can be uh, treated with uh, novel drugs. Uh, in other tumor types, we don't have as much information, but we estimate that about 50% or more of patients who will be eligible for this uh, therapeutic approach will have actually a driver, uh, which means a Achilles heel in, the, in their tumor that can be used for treatment. Now, you mentioned novel therapies. It, it is my understanding that since we're able to offer this therapy, or excuse me, offer this diagnostic approach, genomic precision medicine approach to patients, that it then gives patients access to drugs that we wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain from them. That is absolutely correct. The, uh, the new waves of agents that are offered in clinical trials, most of them are based on the genetic makeup of the tumor. So as a comprehensive cancer center, we have access to a large array of novel studies that make use of agents that can only be prescribed once the tumor genetic makeup is available. That's why this is such an important step for patients who have run out of options using standard therapies. Now, what can we tell potential patients about uh, insurance coverage, Medicare coverage for this type of testing? So that's a very important question, and I'm very happy to say that uh, Wake Forest uh, has now a comprehensive coverage for precision medicine with its own insurance company, MedCost. For other insurance companies, it will be on a case-by-case -case basis, but what we are seeing nationally is more and more third-party payers uh, see this uh, precision medicine approach as a very valuable option for patients who have end-stage cancer because it frequently offers a treatment that may, at the end, cost less than rehospitalization with chemotherapy side effects, which are frequently more toxic than these novel therapies. Right. Yeah, I'm very proud of the fact that we actually uh, led with our own investments here by providing coverage for our own employees for this very important new test. What's this field going to look like um, 10 years from now? I think 10 years from now, we will not treat cancer based on the histology, which is what we have all learned at medical school. A colon cancer and a breast cancer may be more analogous to a leukemia for certain patients, while for others, uh, their tumor will be treated with the uh, standard therapies that we have used for many years. I think we are going into a sub-classification 
of all tumor types that will be sliced into multiple uh, small groups that will respond far better to novel therapies than they have to, um, I would say, current and older therapies. Yeah. It's an exciting vision of the future. Thanks for everything you're doing for Wake Forest Baptist. Very exciting times for the Cancer Center and for the institution as a whole. Thank you very much. In closing, again, I want to thank Dr. Pash for his important contributions, but Boris would be the first to tell you that this took a true team effort in order to bring this new technology to bear to improve patient care in North Carolina and, frankly, this part of the United States. This took an effort from researchers, uh, from our finance folks, from our insurance experts and others in order to make this happen. And I'm very grateful for this amazing team effort. Good day.